And did not Nathanael himself say, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? God seems to take pleasure in visiting those places and those people that come from the backside of the tracks. He's not going to allow anything deceptive to come into Brownsville and upon his flock. He protects us. And you just know it because his love for his people. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> He protects us. He wants, he wants, he wants everyone. He, there's not much, not much more time. And he, he aches and he, he grieves. He's not going to allow anything deceptive to come into Brownsville and upon his flock. He protects us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Sitting next to me is my lovely wife, Robin. Hi, everyone. So, first of all, happy Father's happy Day. Happy Father's Day. And today, in honor of Father's Day, we are going to be starting a new video series on the Brownsville Revival. And why is that? The first message of the Brownsville Revival was preached in Pensacola, Florida, on Father's Day, June 18th, 1995. Yep, and that's where it supposedly all began. Years and years of revival from June of 1995 all the way into the early 2000s there at the Brownsville Assembly of God. Now, the thing we are going to be focusing on in this video is, first of all, is the Brownsville revival something that happened spontaneously? Steve Hill comes as a special guest speaker there on Father's Day, 1995, and he preaches a message and the Holy Spirit falls and we have revival. Or was the Brownsville revival something that was orchestrated, planned um, from the get-go? And that's what we're going to be looking at because just going to give you a quick uh, answer, a quick answer to what we think it was. Yeah, we think it was orchestrated. We'll go with orchestrated for yeah. 200. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Lots of connections to Toronto, mm -hmm. lots of connections to the Laughing Revival that had been going on years prior to that. Yep. So this was not a spontaneous move. No, not at all. And one of the things that we need to look at first is John Kilpatrick's dissatisfaction with what he had already had, okay? Yeah, if you had seen our uh, videos on the Toronto Blessing, one of the videos showed the Arnots, a clip of the Arnots, talking about how they just wanted more. They just weren't satisfied. It was very nice having people get saved, mm. but they felt like they were missing out and they wanted more. The thing that happened to us during the 80s when we were pastoring in Stratford, which is Carol's hometown, we, we were working on the heart issues. So we were spirit-filled, baptized Christians, um, but it, our whole thing focus was on evangelism on Jesus, which is a good thing, but there's actually much more. Yeah, salvation, uh, leading people to Christ, bringing the gospel to them, mm -hmm. seeing them repent and uh, receive forgiveness of sins, that wasn't enough. I mean, that was okay. That was all good, was good. but they wanted to f experience more. That was the are not. Kilpatrick had the same, had a similar, uh, similar experience. None of us had a clue as to what revival was, not even pastor, but just a hunger, a desperation for the presence of God, for something more than what we were doing just on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. You know, that was no longer cutting it. Before revival broke out, friend, in this church, there was times I came down to this church and I would lay on the front row behind those chairs. There was no chairs up here then. I lay on the front row. And I'd come down here some morning, just put on a pair of sweatpants, never cut the lights on. And I'd hit the security system in the back and let myself in and lock the door behind me. Three or four o'clock in the morning. Something deep inside of me was calling out to the deep of God. And I said, Lord, there's got to be more. 
And I would come in here in this building and I would scare myself, friend. It was the stillness of that dark pre-dawn hours. Four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, and I'd lay on that front row and I'd grab my belly and beller out like a cow. Oh, God! I need you, Lord! I would walk these floors and I would cry out loud. I knew nobody was around and I knew nobody could hear. And I'd lift my voice sometime till I would be hoarse and I'd say, God, there's more. There's got to be more. I thank you, Lord, for the church. I thank you for the building. I thank you for my wife and children. But, oh, God, I'm dying inside. And I would say to God, if you don't come, if you don't come in this place, I can't take it. And it wasn't stress. It wasn't pressure. I had no stress and pressure like that. It was just <clears throat> deep calling unto deep. And it was a yearning in my heart for Him. I had, I had people. I didn't want people. I wanted Him. And I just would cry out and yearn. And I said, God, how long? There's got to be more. There has got to be more. So very similar experience uh, with between Kilpatrick and the Arnots and Randy Clark. Everybody wants more. More of what? Randy Clark claimed to be just a mediocre pastor for 23 years, was going through a very dry spell, very discouraged, very depressed, and he just wanted more when he got anointed. So we had a couple of questions, and I'm sure you had a lot of questions when you were watching that clip as mm -hmm. well. And the first one is he kept saying there's got to be more. And like like you said, Danny, more of what? More like I want, I need you, Lord. And I keep thinking, was he depressed? Because it sounded like a depressed person would... He doesn't mention depression at all. No, he doesn't. But so, um, so as a he, here's just my own thoughts here. And we were talking about this earlier. Hmm. My own thoughts are one of the highest callings a, 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 a man can have is to be a pastor. To be called by Christ to pastor his flock, to shepherd hmm. his flock, to open up God's word each and every week and preach the scriptures, exposit the scriptures, open up the scriptures to God's people and to feed his sheep. Mm. That was not enough for John Kilpatrick. That was not enough for the Arnots. That was not enough for Randy Clark. They all wanted something more. And I think what that more was, they wanted an experience. They were not satisfied with what God had already given them. And that's his word. His word is not enough. His word is not sufficient for them. They want experience. I agree. I think that, I, and let us know what you think, but m so many Christians go through a time of a dry spell, right? Mm -hmm. where, where things become difficult or life seems to be very mundane. And uh, during those times, we are reminded as we go through God's word and through fellowshipping with others that God's God's plan is still in place. Mm. God is still, we still have the indwelling of the Holy spirit. Yeah. It's just interesting because historically, when you look at it and see the are nots wanting more mm -hmm. and Randy Clark wanting more, there was a lot going on in the revival world at that time. Mm -hmm. The Argentin Argentinian revival had been going on. Um, throughout the 80s and was getting stronger and stronger. The Arnotts actually went down to visit that. Um, the Laughing Revival Rodney with Rodney Howard, Howard, Howard Brown. Brown, he arrived in the United States in about 1989 and just started taking off from there, and right? Th yeah, and I think it was in 93 when he visited the Carpenters Church in Lakeland, Florida, and then that revival kind of took off. I think he was right. there for, what, 10 weeks or something like that. Well, going in, heaven doubled up. 
Go ahead, let that bubble out your belly. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so it almost looks when you start studying it like these church leaders are looking at What's going on in other churches, not just across America, but in South America and Europe? And there's all of these manifestations going on and all of these exhibitions of what what's happening when people say the spirit of God is falling on them. And they're in a church where nothing is happening and they want to be like the other guys are. Yeah. And that's to, to us. That's exactly what this all looks like. Now, we've got. John Kilpatrick wanting revival. Um, we've got him in this video clip that we just showed praying just, oh, more, more. Oh, God, just, you know, there has to be more. So he invites evangelist Steve Hill to come to speak uh, to the congregation. And Hill says that the only day he has open is Father's Day. Now, this is, again, it's in 1995. The only day he has open is Father's Day. So um, John Kilpatrick says, well, it's, it's, it's really important that you come. So, uh, you know, come on Father's Day. So let's talk a little bit about Steve Hill. So Steve Hill was an evangelist at that time. He had spent eight or nine years with his wife, Jerry, in South America. He had spent time with Claudio Friedson mm-hmm. and Carlos Anacondia, two of the prime evangelists in Argentina at that time. So he was familiar with revivals and he was familiar with what was going on. When Steve Hill is in America, he hears about the Toronto revival and he takes a trip to London because he hears that things are really happening at the Holy Trinity Brompton Church in London, which is headed by um, Sandy Miller. So he gets there, and do we have a clip about- We do. I arrived in London, and we stayed at a bed and breakfast, a dear Christian couple that had been friends with us for years, Richard and Vivian, elderly English couple, got to their house, and I asked them this question. I said, Vivian, where's Holy Trinity Brompton? Where is the Holy Ghost moving? Where are the lines a mile long, people trying to get into the church? She said, Stephen, that's our church. I said, Vivian, talk to me. She said, I've left a pile of literature on your desk table, Steve, upstairs. I want you to read it. I went up and this old boy right here cried for the next three hours. As I read testimony after testimony of the power of God hitting people, coming down, people being filled with the Holy Spirit, people being delivered from problems and habits, marriages being healed, incredible wonders of the Lord. And I did something that I rarely do. I just opened my Bible, just, you know how some of would just, well, I'm going to just open it up and go like that, and there's going to be a promise there. I never do that. But I did that. How many have done that in desperation? Let's be honest. Look around, Pastor. That's how we get our guidance here. Fell open to Acts chapter 18. And you don't have to read this. I'm going to just share it with you. Acts, the end of 18 and 19, is a story of Apollos, Priscilla and Aquila, confronting him about there's more of Jesus. Apollos was an incredible teacher. We have an incredible pastor. Some of you are incredible workers. You want an Apollos, what he said. He was a, the Bible says he was mighty in the things of the Lord. You know what he said when Achilles and Priscilla said to him that there's more? He opened up his heart and said, I want it. Notice what Steve Hill did in that video. And you don't have to read this. I'm going to just share it with you. That's because he didn't want 
anybody to actual actually read the passage. Why don't you read that passage and let's find out what it actually says. Sure. Acts 18, starting in verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. All right. So in that passage of scripture, we see that Apollos, who was an eloquent speaker, was speaking about Jesus, teaching about Jesus, but he only knew about the baptism of John. So Priscilla and Aquila come to him and explain the way of God more accurately. This has nothing to do with Apollos finding out that there's more of Jesus and wanting more. Now, that's what Steve Hill is doing in this Father's Day sermon. And we've Mm. both listened to this thing, and I've listened to it a couple of times. You've listened to it. And he's just, throughout the beginning, from the very beginning, he's priming those people in that audience for something to happen. Something um, extraordinary from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to fall. You're going to get it. You Because you can be a Christian, but you need more. There's more. He is setting the stage for an event to happen. And we would encourage you, if you want to take the time to watch the entire Father's Day sermon, we'll put a link up yes. in our description. Um, like there's a two-hour video that shows that maybe the message takes 45 minutes mm, and, something and like that, yeah. even less. And then the remainder of it is the service afterwards where things start to happen. But, but when you pay attention to what Steve Hill is talking about, he is laying the groundwork that something more needs to happen and it can happen right here and right now with my assistance. Yep. I want it. And then the next paragraph Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? This was in Ephesus. They already had a thing going there. You want to know what they said? We didn't know that there was more. Talk to us. Okay, so now we need to go over to Acts chapter 19, because that's where he's referring to when Paul met uh, some disciples of John Mm -hmm. uh, in in Ephesus. And uh, so let's go ahead and look at that passage. Sure. Acts 19, starting in verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit, not that there is more. More of the Holy Spirit. So he doesn't have the people Mm -hmm. opening up the the, the scripture and reading it. What he's doing is he's adding to the scriptures there. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it wasn't the, the, the disciples didn't say we didn't even know there was more. No, he was. They, they said we didn't even know that there was a Holy sure. Spirit. Shut my Bible. And I said, enough is enough. You have spoken to me. I cried and cried some more. And I, then I went down. It was early in the morning. And I told Vivian, I said, Vivian, call the pastor. I want him to I want to talk to him. Now this man, I had no idea how popular he'd become. He was one of the most respected men in all of Europe. Stay with me, friends. This is important. He made an appointment for me at 3 o'clock that afternoon, the next day, which was phenomenal. He had a thousand people visiting from around the world that day. I walked into his church, which is right next to Herod's, if you've been to London, most the ritziest area of the city. I walked into the church and stepped over 100 bodies trying to get to the pastor. Now these are Englishmen. They don't do this. Now I had been around falling to the ground before. All of us have. All of us have. Just because someone falls to the ground doesn't mean they're spiritual. But I had never seen the depth that was going on here. And I went across. I walked up to Sandy, the pastor, and I looked at him. I said, my name is Steve. He goes, oh my, we have a three o'clock. He said, but look what happened. I said, Sandy, you don't need to talk with me. 
said, pray for me. Lay your hands on me. Pray for me. I didn't tell him who I was. I didn't tell him what I'd done. You want to know what? That doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, friends. Some of us try to build up some type of little foundation before we talk to people. You're going to receive from the Lord this morning. It's going to be because you're hungry. It doesn't make any difference if you've shaken the world with the gospel. It's because you're hungry. Walked up to him and he laid his hands on my forehead. Now I am remembering the wonders of the Lord, fathers. Some of you fathers today, you need this from your heavenly father. When he touched me, the power of God swept through my body. I fell to the ground. I don't ever do that. Ever. For 20 minutes, rivers were flowing through me. A river, just a river. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost, friends. I've seen everything a man can see in missions. I got up, 20 minutes later, transformed. I was brand new. I was brand new. Brand new. Okay. So he has this experience in Sandy Miller's church while he's in England. He gets his, uh, you know, Sandy Miller lays his hands on Steve Hill and Steve Hill falls and rivers, whatever that means, rivers, rivers are going through, through him. I was transformed. That's that's and the key. I was brand new. What did, how in the world? Okay. So. What is it? Paul makes it very clear. If any man be in Christ, yes. he is a new creation. The old is gone. Mm-hmm. The new has come. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So when should we be transformed? The moment we are born again, we're a new creation in Christ. The moment we believe what Jesus did for us, we are a brand new creature. And here Steve Hill is saying, that once Sandy Miller laid his hands on him, he was re-transformed. Re-transformed? Transformed. Brand new. Doesn't make any sense. It's not something that you ever see in Scripture. There's not this, uh, you know, first you're saved, okay, and then you're, uh, you know, later on, sometime down the road, you're, you're, you're brand new, brand new. It it's doesn't almost work like a like level that. thing. Like mm-hmm. you, you always have to work for the next level because then what's going to happen is these people are going to have to get re re transformed because they won't be satisfied with that one time falling down experience that they had. Danny, they'll want more, more. There's nothing in scripture, nothing in scripture no. that even uh, that even it implies these kinds of mani- manifestations. So then question, Danny, I know the Bible talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit and we're commanded to be filled mm-hmm. with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that is, like you said, that's a command. And that is something that is, is in, in the Greek, it's be kind of, it's kind of in, in the um, continual, be mm-hmm. being kept filled kind mm-hmm. of thing. It's something that we're to do. Right. But what they're describing is not being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's more like a being baptized again with the Holy Spirit or being slain in the being spirit. slain in the spirit because right. we are ba- when we are saved we are baptized yes. in the Holy Spirit. There's no second baptism. Uh, <laughs> there's no <laughs> Paul says there's one Lord, one baptism. So there's we you can't separate the baptism of the Holy Spirit with salvation. It doesn't right. work like that. But when you see the manifestations at these revivals, these people understand that there is something more that God can do to you that that is what they want. Yeah, they think that uh, by being slain in the spirit or falling under uh, on the floor and, and feeling these waves of electricity or fire or whatever they're feeling, they they equate that to God into the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And that's what Steve is, Hill is talking about. And he received that from Sandy Miller. So why don't we talk a little bit about Sandy Miller before we continue with the video clip? So Sandy Miller 
headed up the Holy Trinity Brompton. At some point in the previous year, this whole revival, the whole Toronto blessing, had really swept over Mm -hmm. parts of England. And um, one of those parts was a vineyard church that Eleanor Mumford and her husband headed up. So Eleanor had gone over to Toronto and received the anointing from the Arnotts, brought it back to the Vineyard Church, and Sandy Miller wanted to check into it, say, what is going on with these people? And it seems that most of them have the testimony, I wanted to check and make sure that nothing amiss was happening here. So Sandy Miller wants to check into everything he's hearing about all these manifestations, and he goes to Toronto. And he receives the anointing in Toronto and brings it back to Holy Trinity Brompton, where all of these, like Steve Hill mentioned, hundreds of people lying on the floor. This is a an ongoing daily event now. Steve Hill hears about it. And that's why he wants to go, because he wants this anointing. And this anointing, uh, much of it comes via impartation. <laughs> Fill our Lord. Fill our Lord. Fill him, God. Fill him, Lord. Fill him, Lord. More. More, Lord. More. We bless him in Jesus' name. More. Fire in Jesus' name. Like Sandy Miller did to Steve Hill, laid his hands on Steve Hill. Yes. Yeah, you're right. A lot of testimonies, even the person gets touched on the forehead, on the shoulder, or not even touched. And just a Mm -hmm. hand goes near them and they go down. Yeah, really, really freaky stuff. Um, Stuff happens in... Uh, in, in Hinduism and, and the Eastern religions, you see that stuff, mm. uh, uh, crazy stuff. Anyway, yeah. be that it, apart from all that, um, so we have Steve Hill visiting uh, Trinity Church in Brompton, right? And that's where he's at. He's he gets anointed. Gets there. anointed. So we're going to pick up uh, from there and see what else Steve Hill says. Sin, friends, but little did I know how dry I was until God soaked me. I got up, and I want to tell you, you're talking about a uh, 180 degree turn. I got up, was like this. I was like a kid at Toys R Us. And I'm asking, those of you that want prayer in this place, you get prayed for a dozen times. Get prayed for as much as you want. Some of you, God's gonna hit you in a powerful way. I'm gonna have you pray for me. I ran up to another couple, and I went, Pray for me. Pray for suddenly, man. This, this is good. <laughs> this is good. They touched me. Wham! Out I went. Oh, dear Jesus. Laid there. Got up. Came back to the United States of America. My wife picked me up at the airport. I went, baby, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. She goes, honey, the Spirit of the Lord's always been on you. All right, so we see here what he's doing. And understand what he's doing. If you watch the message in the Father's Day sermon... You're going to see this from the very beginning. He is grooming the audience for something that is about to happen. He knows what he wants to happen, but he's got to prepare the people in the uh, congregation there to receive. Yeah, and want more. And so you see what he's kind of doing there. So, Danny, imagine being part of that congregation and listening to this and saying, all these people in England are getting these amazing experiences. Like God is really touching them and hitting them. And then I have this evangelist coming in and talking about how God just touched him and changed his life. And I think I've already got God, but now I'm finding out there's, there's more. more. And I I don't want to miss out on this. And so Steve is just building his case. I was so dried out until God touched me building and building and building his case during this sermon for why these people, why you need more. Yeah. You don't understand, honey. The Spirit of God's on me. That Sunday morning, that, the next day, I said, honey, I want to pray for you. Now, my wife is as strong as a, a the strongest woman of God. She's incredible. She's an anointed intercessor. Nobody can pull the wool over my wife's eyes. She's strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Jerry came into my study. I said, I want to pray for you, baby. I said, I want to lay hands on you. She said, nothing's going to happen, Steve. I said, baby, nothing's got to happen. That's that's the point. I just want to pray for you. I touched my wife. 
she said two words dear Jesus and hit the ground she looked like this you know with the baby sticking up in the air and oh friends my little Ryan comes in pastor we got to spend time with this friends because I'm laying a foundation for these services God is doing something fresh he's doing something new and if you're not careful you're gonna miss what the Lord is doing be careful be careful you wouldn't believe how the Baptists are coming to our meetings I am blown away Catholics are coming out of the woodwork friends Methodists are eating it up I'm going where's the Pentecostals you know, Lord have mercy so the first question I would have is Steve says I'm laying the foundation so you know he's just trying to set everything straight but Danny he said I'm laying the foundation for these services and he was only invited for the one service according to Kilpatrick according to Kilpatrick he was only invited to one service he had Father's Day open and then yeah he did say that I was very curious very interesting anyway so um, now you got Steve Hill there. He preaches this message. At the end of this message, he calls people down for prayer and he starts laying hands on people. And this is this this part of the service is a long time. If you watch the Father's Day uh, Brownsville sermon video, it takes a long time. What is he doing in that? It does. Service? Well, in the beginning, he um. He actually, at the end of his message, he invites people for salvation Mm -hmm. and like seven people come down to get prayed for, um, for salvation. And then he kind of opens it up and says, if you just want to be prayed for, if you Mm -hmm. want more of God or a new experience with God, why don't we show a clip of that? How many want to be prayed for this morning? Some of us are. Everyone who would like a refreshing from the Lord, you'd like God to touch your life, I want you to come forward. Just stand right in here. Fill this whole area, friends. And I'd like for the musicians to play uh, The Name of the Lord is a Strong Tower. Y'all know that? And I want to stay on this song for a while, okay? Rather than moving because it's a song. We're going to stick with it because I don't want them to be singing other songs and changing. Let's just stay with this song, okay? Why don't you start it, Richard? Notice what was going on there as he was praying for people. He was laying on his hands on some people, and he was having a difficult time. And people weren't falling. And it does seem to be interesting that the big uh, revivals, the big modern revivals, happen when a guest speaker comes. For Mm. example, at the Toronto airport, when... Randy Clark. Yes. Yes, Randy Mm -hmm. Clark, who, speaking of anointing, like we had mentioned earlier, Randy Clark had gone through a very dry spell we had talked about and got anointed when he was encouraged to go see Rodney Howard Brown. And when this happened, um, Randy Clark looked at his schedule and Rodney Howard Brown was in um, Oklahoma, in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And he did not want to, Randy Clark did not agree with word faith teaching. So he said, I don't want to go to that. And he said, God accused me of having a denominational spirit. So I went and that is where Ron, Randy Clark got anointed mm-hmm. by Rodney Howard Brown. So thinking back, John Kilpatrick wants more. Mm-hmm. He wants revival. He hears about Toronto and he sends his wife up. And we have a clip about Brenda going to Toronto. Yes. We were talking about me coming to Pensacola. We'd always turn the conversation to Toronto. And he'd go, what do you think about it? I go, well, I don't know. What do you think? You think it's just a bunch of strangeness or do you think there's God in it? He said, I don't know. I honestly don't know. He said, but I tell you what. He said, Brenda, 
and one of the ladies in my church, his Brenda's pastor's wife, they're going up there, and they're going to look it over. And she said, if, he said, if anything's strange, Brenda will pick it up. So she's kind of like we are. I said, okay. Pastor had heard about a revival in Toronto, and so he said, Brenda, I want you to go up there and check it out, and I'll stay here with Mother. And so I said, okay, I will. So I took a friend of mine, it was a uh, deacon's wife, Cheryl Seitler, and we flew to Toronto, not knowing what to expect when we got there. So we uh, went to the services, and being Pentecostal, uh, their worship was uh, a different. The songs that were more upbeat, and uh, people were running the aisles, worshiping the Lord with banners, and dancing, and singing, and the young people, I couldn't get over the young people. They were jumping up and down and so hilarious in their worship. But, uh, and I knew that was God because young people just don't do that. They're so self-conscious. And you know, nothing offended me at Toronto. I just knew it was God. I, I loved it. But that night, uh, I was standing in the line and just a little lady came by and she said, uh, what is your name? And I said, Brenda. She said, what do you need from the Lord? I said, well, I'm just a pastor's wife, and I'm just here for a refreshing, so anything God wants to do for me, you know, I'll just take it. And so she raised her hand. She never touched me, and this power of God came on me, and this intense heat came on my head, and it stopped at my neck, and it was just like fire on my head, and my toes went up. And she said, I just felt something warm just start over the top of my head. And said, by the time it reached my feet, I couldn't stand up. And she said, I've never fallen out. And she said, I fell backwards. I fell on the floor. There was nobody to catch me, nobody there. And she said, I thought I was there a few minutes. And she said, my friend who went with me said I was there like almost a little over an hour. And she said, I got up and I just felt so clean and so changed. And she said, John, I don't know what it is. I don't know. She said, but I know God's there. And I said, Lord, here I am. And it was like I was a little child. <laughs> and I would sit there, and it was like I was a tea bag in a teapot. And he was just pouring in on me his love. I have never felt such love. I love John Kilpatrick, but this was different. This was something I had never known that you could have with God. And it was intimacy. All I could do was cry. And I would just, he knew my heart that I was thanking him. Father, I just thank you. There were just no words that could hardly be spoken. It was so intense at times. At, at times I would say, Father, if you don't stop, you're going to kill me. I can't live. His presence was so real. Pastor John told me, he said, Lyndall, after I'd agreed to come, he said, uh, would you be interested in going up to Toronto and just looking it over? And I said, you know what? I'm curious enough to get, you know, because still we, even though God had touched Brenda, you know, we're very cautious, you know, so. I wound up going to Toronto, and the Lord touched me there. And it changed everything because God touched me in such a wonderful way that all I yearned for was intimacy. I wanted to be intimate with the Lord. I didn't care about praise anymore. I didn't want to be jubilant and jumping and carrying on. I wanted to just be quiet and just get intimate with the Lord and weep and cry and worship. Okay, so notice how she knew God was in Toronto. Notice how she knew. I think it was because the young people were jumping up and down and, and praising dancing. God. Yeah, because young people don't do that. So I knew it was God. That's the first thing. And then her saying that she just she just knew. She just knew it was God. How do you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, the, go ahead. No, I was going to say the, the Bible makes it clear that Satan appears as an angel of light. He is he knows the human condition. He knows uh, people better than we know ourselves. And he knows how to deceive. How do you know that uh, that was God there right. at Toronto? Right. And even her experience or encounter um, 
that that when she went down, she felt this intense heat mm-hmm. over her head that spread across her whole body. And that was the power of God. And honestly, I would be very, very concerned about that. I'm like, number one, I would want the scriptures to show me that this is what I can expect as his child is an encounter where he will overcome me and I will have these physical sensations, Danny. Yeah, there is nothing, nothing in the Bible that even implies this kind of thing, even resembles uh, this kind of thing. And so when you say that that's God, this experience that you're having, this fire that you're feeling, this electricity that's going through your body, Mm -hmm. these waves of emotion that you're experiencing, that's the only thing you have to judge whether or not that is from God. There's nothing objective there. There's nothing you can say, okay, is this something that, is this what the Bible says happened? There's no way to test this. And the Bible tells us where to test the spirits. How are you going to test that? I just knew it was. I believe it. I think you bring up a very good point. And and the fact of the matter is we need to be testing through God's word, Mm -hmm. not testing through our experiences that make us feel, as she said, clean and changed. Or like Lyndon Cooley says, he wants to be quiet and experience more intimacy with God. We know, there's a lot of false religions out there, Danny, that have us go through experiences mm-hmm. that make us feel better. Yeah. We feel good. We feel better. Yeah. There's yoga that makes your body feel better. You know, there's all kinds of things. But, but we do have to test them against scripture. That has to be the ultimate authority. And their, um, their desire to see uh, what was happening in Toronto led to John Kilpatrick actually going down. So we should probably talk about that for a moment. All right. So John Kilpatrick himself wanted to go to Toronto. So a, a group of them, including him and his wife, they all head out there. And on the way down, John gets sick. He has a medical crisis. He he uh, believes he's having a heart attack. And so they end up going to the hospital and they give John Kilpatrick nitroglycerin He feels better, so they think it's his heart. Of course, later on, they find out it wasn't. But he ends up having to stay in the hospital. So they go on to Toronto without him. Without John, Mm -hmm. right. Um, So now everyone's back at Brownsville. And when they get back, um, they actually show tapes of the Toronto Blessing to the Brownsville congregation, kind of, again, prepping their hearts for what is going to happen Mm -hmm. in the near future, they're hoping. Like, they want revival to come. So they're just kind of preparing everyone. Some reports actually state that they have people connected to Rodney Howard Brown, who were his followers, come and sit in their congregation Mm -hmm. and have more emotional responses to some of the sermons being preached this is way prior to father's day in order to again like kind of what till the soil but you know Mm -hmm. prepping everything for that experience um the brownsville team had a south african revival group called the mcgregors um show up in june in the beginning so this is like a couple of weeks prior to the steve hill event come and Um, have really moving revival services again just just to prep the way just waiting 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 Mm -hmm. for the big event in addition to which months before the father's day event john kilpatrick reportedly uh throws his keys on the table at a board meeting and says if revival does not come to brownsville I quit like he was full in a hundred percent. Yeah. This is what has got to happen at our church and it's going to happen or else. Yeah. And so while it does not leave a lot of room for the spontaneous work of the Lord as they claim that this was. No, not at all. And so while John Kilpatrick is in the hospital, Mm. um, Brenda, has she's back at the hotel 
And she's just like, Lord, I don't understand this. Why in the world? I really want right. uh, John to go and experience the power of the Holy Spirit and all this other kind of stuff. Brenda had experienced the Holy Spirit. Others had experienced Lyndon the Holy Cooley. Spirit. Mm-hmm. Lyndall Cooley had experienced uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, and so John Kilpatrick kind of, I guess, you know, in his own words, felt like he had been kind of left out. Right. So. She really wanted him to experience that. Well, that night she has a dream or a vision, if you want to call it that, from God that he's on some steps or something. I can't remember where he was at, but he was on some steps and the power of God came and he fell out. And that night the Lord gave me a dream and it was like I was at an airport getting uh, airline tickets, but then it was also like I was in a train station or a place like that there were pews there and uh, my husband was waiting on me to get the tickets and I was standing there at the desk and I looked back and I saw my husband he was out cold laying on the steps and I said oh look at there I said he didn't have to go to Toronto after all God's touched him right here well when Father's Day came that's exactly where pastor went down was right on the steps just like I saw it in my dream and so that, by the way, is kind of the watershed, really, moment for that revival because John Kilpatrick was supposed to be this really reserved pastor, this guy that was always in control. Mm-hmm. And when he falls out, that's when people say, well, we kind know this is from the God. Doors, yeah. Right. We know this is from God because this pastor would never just, uh, you know, do a courtesy fall. He would just, (laughs) I don't think I've ever heard that before. Yeah. He would just, uh, you know, he, he would be so reserved and so cool and calm and yet he just falls out. So this is a big deal. And we have a clip about this moment. So she had the vision and then she said that actually happened at the father's Father's day. Day. And that's what we're showing. Okay. Yep. And when I walked across this platform before God, I did not know that in a matter of seconds, my life, this church, and my ministry, and everything was going to change. I had no idea. And my husband heard a sound when they were down there. They were just down there a few minutes, and he heard this sound, and he thought something was wrong with the sound equipment, and he looked up, and all of a sudden, one of those suddenlies that God has, this river, we call it the river of God, just came right through his legs and his ankles went out and he just thought, Lord, what is this? And Tony, one of the men, saw him and he saw he was in distress and he said, Pastor, do you need help? And he said, yeah, help me on the platform. So he walked him up as best he could to the platform and by the time my husband got to the platform, he knew that this was God. And you see, God always comes to the headship first. If the pastor doesn't want this move of God, he will not come. It has to come through the pastor. And when my husband made a declaration and said, folks, this is it, get in. This is what we've been praying for for two and a half years. This is God. When he said that, it was like all heaven just came down. And my husband just fell out in the spirit right on the steps where I saw him in the dream. And when I said that, I fell right here behind the podium and I hit my head. My head just bounced on that hard marble floor. I remember it bouncing. And I hit and it felt like I instantly weighed 10,000 pounds. It felt just like I weighed 10,000 pounds. And I tried, I struggled to get my head up off the floor and my neck was sore for two or three days after that. I struggled so hard to get my head up and I couldn't even get my head up. But it wasn't scary. It didn't feel claustrophobic, nothing like that. It felt like that God had just pulled a big quilt up over me and tucked me in and kissed me and said, I just lay here. Your pastor's out for the count, by the way. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> and I Friends, knew when I saw that, I was, I was almost in shock. Stay with us. I remember he was so drunk. I, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say that, drunk in the spirit. I remember I looked at him and he, he, he was just laid out, he had his arms out. And I remember his, his hand was like this and he, had, and he did his pinky just like that. And I, I was looking at him and I saw his pinky move and I'm like, what is, what is he trying to do here? You know, he's just out cold. And, uh, but I saw his pinky move and I said, well, I guess he wants me to come over there to him. And so I walk up to him and he goes, wet my lips. 
wet my lips. He couldn't even lick his lips. He was so drunk. And so I had to go get some water, get a handkerchief, and dab his lips for him. He was so out of it. It quickly began to look like kind of a madhouse out there. You know, you didn't know quite what was going on uh, and what was going to be happening next. And then, of course, when Pastor went down onto the platform, you know, I, I can remember through the through the headsets and you know, all the camera guys, you know, it was a kind of a collective whoa. And the most wonderful thing that I remember about Father's Day that I'll never forget as long as I live is the scripture, the Bible says in Psalms, blessed are they that know the joyful sounds. And for the first time in my life, I heard joyful sounds come into a sanctuary. I heard wails, wailing, shrieks of joy. I heard sobbing, I heard laughter, holy laughter, but it wasn't giddy laughter. It was holy, it was a holy thing. I couldn't open my eyelids, the glory was so strong on me, I couldn't even lift my eyelids, I couldn't lift my head. But my, my ears were crystal clear and I heard a rumble of many hundreds of voices in this church blend in where it became like a roar of noises of joy and life. And I heard a life. It was just like somebody reached in and took this thing and pulled the veil back, parted the curtain, and just pumped through a tube life into this place. And I, I remember laying there and I said, Jesus, please don't ever let that sound leave this church. So that's how Kilpatrick was taken over by the Holy Spirit, fell under the power, got drunk, whatever you want to call it. Now, before that, he was talking about how he was really just kind of down, depressed, discouraged. Uh, you know, his wife had experienced uh, the power. And when him and Steve Hill and her went out to dinner, they were all sitting around talking about this. And he was just jealous and this and that. So now he gets his experience. And that's where the thing really takes off because people say, well, wow, Kilpat Pastor Kilpatrick is reserved and he would never, you know, uh, you know, just do a courtesy fall. He would <laughs> he would he would he would never do that. So that had to be God. And that's what they say. But as we revisit what we talked about in the beginning, this whole thing, at least from our research, from what the research we've done, this whole thing seems to be orchestrated from the get go. Very well-planned, orchestrated, spontaneous event. <laughs> so, yeah, so you have Kilpatrick desiring re revival, and you heard the clip where he said he knew there had to be more. More, more, there had mm -hmm. to be more, more That's of God. Um, and you have um, him uh, telling, as you mentioned, his board members, unless revival comes, unless we have revival, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm quitting. Um, he sends his wife to Toronto. He sends Lyndall Cooley to Toronto. He himself desires to go there. So there's this whole thing. And then he invites Steve Hill. And as you watch that Brownsville service, and again, we'll put a link in the description. Watch the service. Watch how many times Steve Hill talks about something that's going to happen. God's going to do something. Mm -hmm. And he kind of just grooms and preps them for that. So no, the Brownsville Revival wasn't something that was spontaneous where the Holy Spirit just showed up and they had revival for years. Now, the Browns Brownsville Revival was orchestrated. It was uh, planned. Um, at least that's what we see. What do you guys think? Yeah. Next week, we're going to look a little uh, deeper at some of the messages that mm -hmm. were preached at the Brownsville Revival. And we're going to talk a little bit about the manifestations and the outcomes. Yep. So, Lord willing, we will see you next week. Thanks for watching. Bye.